You're listening to Widowed AF with Rosie Gilmoss and Lucinda Boast. We've invited some members of the world's most exclusive club to bravely share their stories. Join us for some honest conversations about living a different life, the crushing lows, the surprising highs and everything in between. Please note this is a podcast about death. Carefully read the episode descriptions and be kind to yourself. But for now, welcome to our podcast. Let's Let's begin. begin. Hello and welcome back to the Widowed AF podcast. You're joining us for episode three. I'm Lulu, one half of the presenting team. And in today's episode, I've been given the privilege of interviewing the other half of the team, my fellow presenter and dear friend, Rosie Gilmoss. Rosie, welcome to your podcast and thank you for sharing your story today. It's incredibly brave and it's going to help so many people and Having done it myself earlier in the week, I think it's going to help you too. Rosie's is a very unique and moving story which deals with some really difficult issues. So anyone listening to this, please read the description, read the trigger warnings before you press play. Thank you for joining us. So starting at the beginning, Rosie and Ben Moss met in 2004 when Rosie took a part time job at a flooring company whilst at uni. They were married in 2008 and their three children were born in the years following that. A beautiful young family enjoying a happy life together. The life Rosie knew and loved changed forever on the 12th of March 2018, completely out of the blue, when Ben went missing in a scuba diving accident off the Kent coast. A knock at the door from the police whilst Rosie was bathing her children on that Saturday morning, and life as she and her babies knew it was blown apart in a most devastating way. Rose, I don't think anyone can imagine how that day must have played out. And I know the memory must be permanently etched in your mind. So in your own words and at your own pace, talk us through what happened. Thank you, Lou. Um, It feels quite different sitting this side, actually. It's quite nerve wracking, but um, we both felt it was important we do this um, if we're going to ask other people to. Uh, Yes. So 12th of March, Monday, day like any other. Um, I the last words I said to my husband um, as he left the door to go uh, to go diving were, "Be safe, darling." Um, the irony of that is not lost on me, but I'm forever grateful we didn't have a row. Um, I stood in the playground that day um, at pick up time, and I chatted to the other mothers like you do. And uh, <laughs> some conversation topics never change. We were talking about the price of gas and electric. And I just sort of, you know, hard, oh, Ben dropped dead tomorrow. I wouldn't know who even to pay. And he was already dead. And it's only looking back at these throwaway comments that they now carry such magnitude, because, of course, haven't we all you know, said stupid things like that? But I didn't know he was dead, and I wasn't going to find out until that evening. So the day continued as normal. I'd, I'd called his phone. You know, we, we weren't the type of couple that massively checked up on each other. So... Um, I wasn't overly worried, you know, I just figured he'd had a good time. He was possibly they'd gone, uh, there was a pub they used to go and have a meal sometimes. And it wasn't really until I'd bathed the children and was, you know, starting to get a little bit itchy, really. Um, and I'd just got them out of the bath and I was I held Tabby in a, in a towel and, and the door knocked. And my first thought was, he's got his keys. I roll, you know, <laughs> typical man. Um, and I came downstairs and I was still holding the baby and... I had to put the dog into the other room. And in that moment, I sort of noticed, I registered that it wasn't Ben at the door. Um, Through the glass, I could see two figures and they were uniformed officers. And I think it is the the situation we all dread, isn't it? Because they, I don't, I don't know if there is a good scenario when you find two uniformed officers on your door. Um, And at this point I opened the door and, I could feel that sort of trickle of dread, you know, the you know that sort of spidey sense you get that something's not good. Uh, they asked the usual questions, you know, my name confirmed I was his wife. And at this point, I start what I now know is bargaining. And I was saying to them, is he dead? Just tell me, is he dead? Because what I wanted them to say was, no, 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 he's not dead. He's had an accident, you know, <laughs> not, not ideal, but better. And they just, the look on their faces, they, they, they said, please, can we come in? And, and uh, as it transpired, he'd gone into the water at around 9am that morning and he'd never come back up again. So 
So it had taken them, you know, from nine o'clock that morning until past seven o'clock that evening for anybody to tell me. Goodness and I me. Struggled. I struggled with that. I struggled with the thought of him being out there and nobody even knowing he was lost. Of course. Um, there was a lot of, they, they searched the house, they have to. Um, and I think the ground just sort of dropped beneath me, really. Um, it all went a bit black and I sat down and they, once a friend had come to join me, because my parents unfortunately were abroad at the time, and they they said they were very frightened, they thought I might drop the baby. Um, and, and to this day, I don't really know how I didn't, but I, I, I guess she gave to me what I needed, which was an almost a security blanket, and I held on to her. Yeah, you're probably holding on to her even tighter, if anything. Yeah, yeah probably. And of course, she was completely oblivious. Um, at this point, I did lie to the children. The boys came down and they wanted to know, you know, they were excited. Why are the policemen in the house? But I lied. It was a throwaway comment about it being to do with the dog. Um, and, at this, and it was the, probably the last big lie I've told them because it, 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 um, it took a while for them to build trust, took my eldest son to build trust again because it, to him it was quite a monumental lie. Um, but I didn't know what to say. I didn't know no. what was happening. And you I, jump into fierce mama tiger mode, don't you? You just want to protect your babies from the most horrible mm. possibility. And at this point, I didn't know. I didn't know. I, I, no, of the course. The information I was receiving was quite confusing. It was at, on that night, it was after the police had left. Um, I spoke, I, I, mean, I had to make the, another phone call nobody wants to make. I had to bring his mum. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, how did you even disseminate? the information that was confusing to you um, that you couldn't make sense of to, to other people, such as Ben's family? Ben's from a big family. Um, and he, sadly, his, his dad had, had died um, on the same day a few years previously. The coincidence of that is, is quite... That. Yeah, what? and they were very close as well, Ben and his dad. He, and Ben has his five other siblings and, and a mum. And what I, I told his siblings and then I asked one of them to go and sit with his mum and I told his mum. So... Um, that was a noise I never want to hear again, actually. Uh, I didn't tell the children that night. Um, I needed to kind of get my head around what had happened. So I spent the night, much like you described, Googling, how do I, how do I tell my children? Because there was never really any doubt that he died. Um, although he hadn't been found, the conditions of where he'd gone were rough. It was cold, very cold. It was March. It was just after we'd had that beast from the east. Oh, yeah. There was no way we could have survived it. Um, and a Coast Guard, a very, um, a Coast Guard was very candid with me, actually, and told me the chances were very slim, if, if any at all. And by the morning, those chances really had gone. So, so I had to tell the children. I mean, Tabby was six months, so she was sort of, I, I don't really include her in this, obviously, but um, at six o'clock when the boys woke up, I... Um, I had to use the D word, I had to say dead, because there, there was no room for ambiguity. If I'd said he was lost um, or missing, it gave them hope. And I felt very much at this point that hope might be the thing that, that destroyed us, because whilst we didn't have that finality and clarity of there being a body, you have to make peace or accept that they have gone, maybe even sooner than you would if there was a body, because... There'll always be a part of me that wonders. I don't know what happened. Um, of course. But the responsibility of that decision being in your hands, Rose, um, I can't imagine anyone being in that position to, to make that final call to say, actually, he's not coming back. I, I, need, to, I need to acknowledge that and accept it. And that was one of the things I really only, really only processed quite recently. Um is the fact that I essentially had declared him dead. There was no doctor, no police officer to do that. I, I did it. I announced, I, and I did a, a Facebook plea asking for help in searching. Did you have people at that time come back to you and say, oh, don't give up hope or anything yeah. like um, that? I can imagine that's really unhelpful. Uh, it's, it comes back to this thing of people meaning well. And they did, and it was primarily strangers, actually, that would send me messages of, you know, hope. And I mean, what of course, I hoped that he might turn up on a French, you know, trawler ship, you know, disorientated and confused. Of course, I hoped. I bargained. I begged, and I, I wished for that. But and I, then I, carry on if you want to. 
and I spent, well, I spent the night looking at the moon. It sounds really cheesy saying it now, but I'm looking at the moon and wondering if he could see it. And the thing that really plagued me was the idea of him being cold, cold and on his own. Of course. But, you know, this is a, if those emotions, that rawness, that just having your entire life shattered, I felt really, I just felt so frightened. I felt so frightened and I didn't know... I didn't know what was going to become of us. Um, ben was my everything. He was my rock. He was my best friend. It's so clear and that I've seen some wonderful pictures um, and we've shared them on our social media of you and Ben and the kids. And he was such an integral part of your family's life, wasn't he? He was your king. Um, yeah, he was. And I think I described him as that. Yeah, he was. And I loved, I loved him. And I still love him. And that's something I feel very strongly about is um, they die, but their love doesn't. And I still consider myself married to Ben. Um, and I don't think that will ever change. I, he's still, you know, he's a, such a huge part of my history and I was such a huge part of his. Um, Absolutely. And, part, and anyone part, listening can understand that. And part of doing this is, is part, it's a, you know, to show... This, uh, what happens afterwards, you know, after your world is blown apart and to tell my story. But I, I very much consider this in a way of honouring his memory because this is my, this is how I talk about what happened and, and how we, we got, we got through it or we're getting through it. It's not a, there isn't really an end, is there, when it comes to grief? No, there isn't. Now, going back to that time, um, having declared Ben dead, essentially, um, you were then thrown headlong into an unbelievable legal process uh, in terms of having him officially declared dead. Talk us through that yeah. and how on earth did you approach that? So when somebody dies in circumstances where there is no body, um, prior to the canoe man, it would have been a much simpler process, but unfortunately the law has changed and without a body it's between five and seven years that you would have to wait for a death certificate. Oh, me. I had, Ben was the primary um, breadwinner in our family. So um, he paid the mortgage, he paid the, the car finance, you know, as I said, in the school playgrounds, you know, I had no idea. It, I feel quite stupid now. How did I let myself get into that situation? But you just cannot imagine at that time in your life that this could happen. No. To be honest, I didn't even know if he had life insurance. Um, his will, um, uh, it, was, it didn't have a will, but the marriage kind of um, invalidated any previous wills. So I then began the process of trying to unpick our finances. He was self-employed, so it, um, all income dried up immediately. Um, it, it was quite scary. And, it, and at a time when you were trying to process a loss of that magnitude, having to then navigate financial insecurity um, and the admin, the death admin, they kept coming, the bills kept coming. My parents, um, who are incredible, they gave up, they walked away from their lives and they moved in with me. And I will always be grateful for this. And uh, they, they took on a lot of the administrative side, which was really, really helpful. But essentially, I couldn't do much without a death certificate. Um, there is a fairly new piece of legislation in the UK, and it is called a presumption of death certificate. And it is designed for this purpose. I think it has only ever been used once. It involves going to the High Court. It involves thousands and thousands of pounds of legal fees. I was very lucky that I had a friend who um, is a, a lawyer who reached out to me and she and her law firm did the whole thing pro bono. So, again, a huge debt of gratitude to them because how do people afford that in, in a certain, when you can't access life insurance? God only when knows. So I went to the High Court um, which again, it's a very strange situation to go where the best possible outcome is that you get a document saying that your husband is dead. Indeed. But I did. I was very nervous. I was very apprehensive. I'd, I've never been, I've never been to court before, and I didn't know what, um, I didn't know how they would treat me. And, and he was very compassionate and very kind. This judge, and he immediately issued the document, which proceeded to enable to me to access things like life insurance I didn't I, I didn't have a lot I didn't even have enough to pay the mortgage but it gave it brought me breathing space and time 
I ran Ben's business um, in a slightly shambolic way, not having a huge knowledge of wood flooring or speaking a word of French, which is where it was based. But between <laughs> me and his brother, we did manage to, to kind of keep things ticking over. And I was able to, you know, keep my home and and, and enable my, my children to live, you know, a, a, when I say a normal life, I mean, you know, they were able to, you know, I was able to be at home and, and be around for them, which is what they needed at, at this time. You were amazing through that time. Um, you really were. So the vast majority of us widows have been able to at least have the opportunity to say goodbye to our partner and lay them to rest. And you didn't get to do that in the absence of Ben's body. Um, but how did you approach saying farewell to him? So that has, you're right, that has been one of the difficulties because it is such a, it, it's a, a, a cheesy term, the, the closure of it and also the celebration of their life, which... Um, I think it's just so important to, and just an acknowledgement that they've gone to bring everybody that cared about them together and, and kind of say goodbye, um, as particularly when we, we hadn't been able to. So I looked at some venues. I'm not religious at all. Um, no issue with it, but it's not my, I, I don't. Uh, but a church had felt like it had the magnitude and there was a very lovely lady vicar and she was so compassionate to me and she did she offered to hold a service and also gave him a um a stone in the garden of remembrance so the children and i buried some notes to him and uh, they each have a small i have a small half heart and um the other half is buried in this this plot and then we held a memorial uh which to all intents and purposes was a funeral the, it uh it had we had we all lit a candle there was a friend of mine who had sung um, me down the aisle to my wedding at my wedding to Ben sang the same song um somehow I managed to do a read or I wrote a letter to him my eldest son wrote to him I mean how this seven-year-old child had the balls of steel to do that I don't know um and all of the children were there it is a very personal decision of whether you have your children at something like this I felt it was appropriate because there was no coffin um and my kids needed to say goodbye as much as I did and even the little one I felt that she would always know that she she was there. It's so really it's important, very... isn't it? You know, when yeah. I spoke about the honesty last time and, and the building, you're building the blocks of your bond with them now. Um, it's so much more important. So I really commend you for including them. It was, I think, Monty standing up and speaking, this, you know, tiny little thing of a child. And it, that was, and then... I think that was the point when the congregation all, all, all broke down. But it was it was cathartic and it was important. And we then went to the pub over the road and everybody got absolutely hammered. And we laughed and we cried and, you know, we howled at the moon a little bit. But it, it, I think it did us all good. I met some of Ben's friends I'd never met before. I met his uh, his business partner from out in France. It, 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 it was a way of honouring his memory um, in the, really the only way that we had available to us. Absolutely. So then you began, obviously, the journey that we've all been on, the, your grief journey. Um, so tell us about those early days in your grief and how you went about reaching out for support. So you feel incredibly alone. It was one of the things I used to howl to my mum. You know, I don't want to be alone. I'm so, um, you, you are, initially you have a, a, a lot of support and people, you you're sort of cushioned, you're buffered, aren't you? Everybody, you, there's always somebody in the house, you're very rarely alone. And gradually, people have to return to their own lives. It's not callous, it's not cruel, it is a necessity. People have jobs and families of their own. Um, I was very fortunate that my parents did stay with me, but, you know, I'm, I didn't know who to talk to. And I found myself looking on the internet, looking for, I think I typed in, you know, widowed and alone or widowed and young and... I came across an American group called the Hot Young Widows Club, um, which I love the is this group. It, do you know you'd have loved it actually? It was fantastic, and they had a slightly dark sense of humour. And it, it was run by a, a an American. It's an American group, so they were often up in the, those dark hours in the night. So there was often somebody for me to talk to. But obviously, you can't really meet up with these people or even talk to them often because the timelines that sort of thing. So. I then discovered Way, which is Widowed and Young, uh, a British support group. Um, I met some awesome people, uh, many of whom I'm still very good friends with, yourself included. Uh, and you form little offshoot groups in your tribe and you, we try and meet up if we can. And 
it's something I feel quite evangelical about is that peer support because whatever you are feeling, whatever you have done, whatever, um, you know, this, I, I talk a lot about shame and, you know, you may not behave in a way that you may, makes you proud of in those early days of grief. You may say things or do things that you regret and feel shame about. And what I found is people who weren't widowed just didn't understand. And some didn't understand why sometimes I would respond to messages. Sometimes I would not. Why? And it, but my widow tribe did, you know, we got it and we understood. And you, you, you lean very heavily on, the, <clears throat> on your tribe. And I'm eternally grateful I found mine. And I would very much like to see other people find that path because it, it genuinely makes what is some of the most horrific times in your life that little bit more bearable. It really does. So other than the support of other people, what other coping strategies mm -hmm. did you find in those early days and, and what have you turned to over the years to get you through? So I lent incredibly heavily on alcohol. Same. I, um, yeah, I think it's a very common theme with widows. I have since been died since being very died bad out that I have um, uh, inattentive ADHD which um, explains quite a lot of um, impulsive behaviour, but also it, it is grief. Um, it can be explained through grief as well. So, uh, yeah, alcohol, um, and it, it became a problem. It, and it became a problem. I, was, I wasn't giving either myself or my kids or, or the people around me. Um, in, I wasn't giving them enough. I was, I was hiding behind the bottle. So... It was after my daughter's birthday party um, and I, I'd got very drunk and I woke up with this awful sense of shame and I realised that perhaps I wasn't, I hadn't processed, surprise, I hadn't processed my grief. So I, I, I reached out and I found a therapist and I've been in the therapy with this same woman for over a year now. And during that time, I have made so much progress <laughs> But one of the things she has got me to do is to go back into my grief and to walk back through it. Because by cushioning with the alcohol, with the impulsive spending, with, you know, the, the reckless behaviours, I, and, and I, and I essentially um, medicated myself so that I was able to get through it, which I needed to do to survive it. But now, in order to recover from it, I've got to go back into it. And that's very difficult. But it's also the only thing that works. So I, I'll be five years into this journey in early March and I am only really now in a place where I feel that I've processed my grief to any real extent. I find that I'm crying more even because it, the emotions are quite near the surface. I've described myself as feeling it's a, not a particularly charming description, like an open wound, you know, where any, I'm very, very sensitive. So any I, I I can be quite reactive to things. So I my friends have been very patient with me as I go through this because I'm not always easy. And but I'm so glad I've done it. I feel that by walking this path, I've made a better life for myself for my children. And I feel like I'm properly honouring Ben because what he would want to see is me fly. He'd want to see me and the kids happy. Absolutely. And actually, talking about alcohol, you no longer drink, do you? No, I gave up alcohol. It will be a year on the 6th of March this year. Um, and it has been the best thing I've ever done. I I don't think I will ever drink again because life is, is uh, so much better without it. Now, tell us about the last couple of years and um, up to the present day and tell, tell us what life's like now. So my life's been, um, <laughs> the, the term roller coaster gets overused, but I think it's appropriate here. <laughs> I um in my group of friends that we met through Way, it was a mixed group, and um one of the, the gentlemen in the group, he had a birthday, and we happened to live quite near each other. So we went for a, for dinner as a, a platonic dinner. One of us, me, uh, had a little bit too much to drink and uh maybe instigated a little kiss through the window of the car. This little kiss set off <laughs> a reaction that was unexpected, and we fell in love. And his name is John and he is an incredible man and he makes he's made me and my children very happy. But <laughs> uh, in March 2020, um, he contracted COVID-19 and he uh, he's an early adopter and uh, ever ever the show off, he, he, he got it quite badly. Um, and he spent a month in the ICU where 
when I received a call from the ICU, um, they told me that I should uh, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So I was staring down the barrel of being essentially widowed again, because John and I had put an offering on a house. We had started to blend our families. Um, it, it felt, again, like the earth had just been snatched from beneath me. And I had to wake his daughter up and... Sorry. Uh, no, take your time, Rose. I remember that time. And the whole world was in confusion. No one knew what COVID was. And John was in that first kind of tranche of people to contract it. And um, we didn't know, did we? We didn't know what he was experiencing. You couldn't speak to him. We thought he was going to die. That's essentially what people were dying. Um, so I had to tell his his daughter who had lost her mum when she was five. I had to tell her her dad had gone to hospital. We, we I kept it, you know, fairly vague because well, I didn't know. So again, I and then I had to tell my children who'd come to view him as as their as a father figure. Um, it, the story ends positively. He he recovered. He made a full recovery. He uh, he couldn't walk. He couldn't climb stairs. Um, he had to basically be rebuilt with the help of a, a physio and a lot of love uh and on the 4th of january uh 2021 we got married so we are we've created a, uh, what we call our tribe it's our blended family we have four children between us um it's not without its difficulties of course it's not the, you know but life is good life is good um yeah i i so life's good now, and um, yeah, that's it's so wonderful to see you and your tribe surviving. And I know, I know there are challenges. There really are, and the kids are all in different phase now, aren't they? They, you know, yeah. they're going through it too, the same way that you are with with therapy. You're revisiting your grief, and they're going through periods of grief too, which is inevitable. Yes, um, it is. They start to ask questions as they get older. Um, one of my children um, has autism, and he asks in, in he likes to know very um i have to be very factual with him um, yes. and the timing of the questions are not always appropriate you know i will sometimes be asked you know did a shark eat daddy's body in the supermarket and things like that not, not so much now i hasten to add but back in uh so yes you and my daughter who was six months at the time she's now five and at school so she's asking questions and um having you know in, and realizing that there aren't that other, most other children don't have two daddies, one in he, you know, one in heaven and, and one at home. So that's and, and I've always been very open. And um, the, the children, you know, as far as she's concerned, she has two. That she has a Johnny and she has a daddy. Um, and you know that that's okay. And you know, families come in all different shapes and sizes. And I, I think I don't ever want them to feel that um, that sense of being a bit of a freak you know, that I felt when I was first widowed, that it's that troll under the bridge thing, isn't it? You know, nobody kind of knows what to do with you and you, you, you don't fit in anywhere. And I'm conscious of the children ever feeling like that because, um, you know, you hope there won't be too many children that they come across at school and things. You do have a, a, a dead parent. But um, I think the other aspect of peer support is that our children mix with our children. So they all you know other other people who've lost a parent which does I think it does help them process much like it does us it does it's definitely helped my daughter for sure mm -hmm. and she feels like part of your tribe you know when we come down and see you in Kent mm -hmm. which is wonderful um okay so finally here come three questions we are going to ask all of our guests and you are no exception to this rule Mrs Gilmoss um so the first one what has been the most memorable clangor or inappropriate thing someone has said to you after being widowed? There's been several. Uh, I did have to think quite hard about which one I was going to use, but I'm going to use one because it was said to me by a professional. Um, I was I was self-referred for some therapy quite fairly early on, within about six months, and I was assigned a lady um, through the NHS, um, and she... she she wasn't an unpleasant woman, but she was quite abrupt. And she said to me one day in a session, she said, oh, I Googled you. You used to be ever so glamorous. Jesus Christ. I didn't really know what to say. And now I think I would just, I think I would have been um, able to say that's hugely inappropriate. But I just sort of 
muffed about, oh, well, you know, I, I, I don't tend to wear makeup on a, a therapist. And, and sort of made excuses for that fact that I wasn't glamorous. <laughs> I don't say nothing, woman. Goodness me. I mean, most of these gaffes, we can sort of say uh, they meant well. Yeah. <laughs> That's not meaning well, is it? That's just I'm downright not... rude. But I feel like if you're a professional who's working with bereaved people, that's maybe um, something that you should not say. So no, that, yeah, that, that sticks out for me as, as, my, as the big one. Oh, dear. Well, secondly, what is the one song that reminds you the most of Ben and why? Uh, so it's Rocket Man by Elton John. Uh, he, he was an Elton John fan. It didn't really sort of tally with, with who he was, but he had some, he had quite um, eclectic taste in music. And... Oh, he doesn't like Elton anyway. But yeah, Rocket Man. I had it played at his memorial. I can't really listen to it now. So when um, when it comes on the radio or something, I, I do tend to turn it off. I need to be in the mood to hear it because it 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 was the moment that I broke down in church, and it does tend to send me hurtling back to that moment. But it's still a it's still one of my favourite songs, and I don't know why I picked it. I think I liked the idea of him sort of being up there somewhere, and when you don't have a, a faith, you kind of have to create your own, don't you? You do. Um, but it was the <clears throat> it's the lyric I I miss my wife that, that tipped me over the edge. Absolutely, no good choice. And finally, what's the <laughs> one piece of advice you would give to someone supporting a person who's newly bereaved? Find your people. Find your tribe. Join any support group that you come across. You can always leave them. I would obviously recommend Way because I think it's a really good entry point into meeting your peers. And there are lots of um, offshoots. So you might be able to join a widowed and parenting or there's some groups for um, people who've got children who are neurodivergent. And actually, there's a new group for people themselves who are neurodivergent. So there's, there is a, there is, you would find there is an offshoot and a group for everybody. Um, and I think if you can find your tribe and your peer support, the road that you have to walk will be easier on you. Um, and I, I just wish you, I wish you luck and I wish you compassion if you're, if you're starting on this road, because it is hard and it is long, but you will get there. Excellent advice. Um, oh, listen to us, listen to us. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Rose, thank you so much for sharing your story so beautifully. Um, I really felt your emotion and your love for Ben that lives on, which is yeah. amazing. And thank you to everyone for joining us for this really special episode and for your support so far for Widowed AF. Really grateful thank to you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening today. We'll be back with you soon for more from the front line of loss. But for now, as you were.